if, if I haven't met you yet, my name's Gary. I'm one of the elders here in the church, and it, it kind of has fallen on me that any time Philip is away from the pulpit, I get the opportunity to, to, to stand in here and, and uh, share the gospel with you folks. But kind of as an aside this morning regarding Philip, those of us who have been around since the, the time that he joined us, we, we know the kind of pastor we have, right? But for those folks, maybe you've just been here a short time, you haven't got to know Philip very well yet, and I'm just going to tell you that the reason I'm here today is Philip is preaching in another church. He fellowships with a group of pastors here in northern Michigan. They get together and pray, and they share victories, and they share burdens and concerns and ideas. And it's just a, a way for, for peers to gather together and support each other. But sometime not too long ago, one of those, one of those pastors passed away. And the church's interim pastor starts next week. But So this group of pastors has been coming together or individually in the meantime to fill that pulpit. And the, the thing I've learned about Philip is he understands his, his job is here, right? But his calling and his ministry is to the kingdom of God. And that's an example for all of us. It doesn't just end in this building. You know, it goes beyond these walls and into the community, whatever it looks like. And just kind of along those same lines, you, you may not know this either, but once a week, Philip is leading a Bible study down at West Shore Community College. Just started this year. And he had a great first semester uh, with, with kids making uh, commitments to, to join their journey, join their walk in the, with the Lord. And he, had a, he just sent out a, a text this week that he had a great first first meeting with, uh, with a new bunch of kids, or maybe it was the same bunch of kids, I'm not sure, you know, to start the new semester. So, you know, just a, just a little bit of the behind-the-scenes stuff that, that, uh, that Philip does that, that, you know, I don't think we all, uh, all know about, and he, and he doesn't need us to know about him. You know, he's just, this is something he does, okay? I understand there's some kind of a football game this evening. Is that, is that right? <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was going through the closet this morning, and, and just for what it's worth, the, the, the light in our closet blew out this week. Hadn't been replaced yet. Debbie hadn't got to it. But <laughs> <laughs> I, gra I grabbed the shirt down off the hanger and brought it, you know, brought it out into the bedroom. Well, it was, I'm, it was red and gold. I'm sorry. It was, I thought, man, I can't wear that. I'm not. I, I don't have a. I don't have a dog in the race. You know. I'm. I'll be rooting for the Lions today, just mostly out of pity, if nothing else. But <laughs> I, I, I can't. I can't wear that. And I don't have a lot of Lions gear, but this is the best I could do as far as Honolulu blue and silver and white. Okay. <laughs> and I was also able. Well, and and. One more thing about the Lions. Where's Sam? Sa Sam, when did you put that playlist together that we sang this morning? Sometime last month? First song, The Lion and the Lamb. <laughs> and I can't, which, no, there was another song that had reference to the lion in it. No 49ers anywhere. I don't think you even find, you don't find 49ers even in scripture anywhere, right? So, how prophetic is that? Okay? And I did manage to work the lions into the message this morning. So, we're, and I need, your, I need your help on this. We're going to go through a little bit of a process here as far as belief goes, okay? That's what we're talking about today. If you hope the lions are going to win this evening, raise your hand. Okay. Pretty fair, I'm not going to count hands. That's a pretty fair bunch. 
if you think they have a 25% better or chance to win, raise your hand. Okay, everybody's kind of sticking with 50%. 75%. Ninety percent. <laughs> if you absolutely wholeheartedly believe, if you would wager everything you have on the Lions today, <laughs> raise your hand. We got one true fan right here. Got both hands up. <laughs> and I knew I could count on Hoyt or somebody in that family to, to be a true believer. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about today, true belief. Anna, can you put that first slide up, please? I posted a question. I, I don't always do this, but we, we typically do this as a congregation. I want you to kind of hash through this this morning, get a couple, three people, whatever around you, and work through for maybe a minute what it means to truly believe in God. Okay? It's not a complicated question. The answer may be a little complicated. The kids are showing us right now. But just, just take, a, just take a, a minute or so and work through in your head what it truly means to believe in God. And then we'll get started. Okay, I, I turned it off while I blew my nose. Out of <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so, so our belief in God starts with existence, start uh, realizing his existence, recognizing that. 
the second thing that should show in us is a commitment and a life change. And I was saying that they're all things that we know in our head that never make it to our heart where they can be, where they can be, uh, be shown. And I, I'm, a, I'm a prime example of that as well. I, li I live at the corner of 12th and Maple in Manistee, which is a school zone. And I know if you're heading south, from the time you hit 1st Street until you hit my street, there are at least five speed limit signs, 25 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour. It never fails. I'll leave here Sunday afternoon going down, going down Maple, and my co-pilot will say, you know, the speed limit's 25. <laughs> what, are you, what, what are you going? I, well, 32, 35. And again, James tells us that faith that does not result in action is dead faith. So we can know it up here, we can have, we can have faith, but if we're not exercising, and if we're not showing that faith, it's dead. And lastly, it kind of summed up like this, we have to believe that he is all that he says he is. He's done what he said he would do, and he can and will do what he says he's going to do. I'm going to say that again because it's, it's kind of combobulated. We have to believe he is all that he says he is. He's done what he said, and he can and will do what he says he's going to do. So if, if we take this uh, definition of believing in something, why is that so important in our faith? I mean, if you think about it like this, there, there, are, there are several people in this room right now who I know on a very intimate basis. You know, we've, we've shared things together, and cried together and laughed together, and we know each other, we know each other really well. And I like to think I believe in them, and they believe in me. And it's like, I was thinking, you know, if somebody, if somebody came to me, or if I heard somebody in a conversation saying something about one of those people that I knew was a lie, how would I react? Of course, I would, I would say, hey, I, you know, that's, that, I know that person. I know that's not true. That, that's just a lie, and I won't, I won't let that affect affect the way I think about that person. So we come together this morning acknowledging I think that we, we live in a, a, a broken and sinful world full of broken and sinful people and we think back to the creation story how God created this perfect world, this perfect environment and had two people walking in harmony with him and with each other. So we think, how did we get from there to where we are now? You can put that next slide up, Anna. It all happened here in the, the, the third chapter of the whole Bible is when the problem started. We made, it through th we made it through two chapters without too much trouble. The third chapter reads like this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. So that's God's truth. The serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate 
And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed together fig leaves and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The pivotal piece in that whole passage is in verse 5, when they believed the lie about God. They knew the truth, they knew the truth here, but they believed the lie. But the thing is, Ever since that time of the fall, God has been at work. He's working to restore us to that original image in which we were created. And the verse I like to look look to for uh, affirmation of that is Romans 8.28. I think it's one that we all like to banter about and throw in other people's faces when things are going bad. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Okay. All things work together for good. It, they don't work together for convenience, for comfort, for lack of suffering. The good that all these things are working for is for us to be restored to the image of God. Yeah, the image of God. Which we had the perfect example for in our Savior Jesus. For those who are called according to his purpose. It's a great reminder. Paul wrote this, you know, 2,000 years ago. The thing is, it had been happening since creation. It's happening now, and it will happen until... Until Jesus decides otherwise, it's time to come back. But God's work is always toward getting us, you and I, back to the image in which we were created. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we're thankful to come here this morning, gather in your house with your family and study your word. We realize we're a lost and broken people, Father, and we are striving to recover and return ourselves to to the image that, that you created. We know we can't do that on our own. It's only by your grace, as we sang this morning, that it's your grace that really makes me want to change, realizing the the, the price that you paid and the, the gift that you offered to allow me to establish and maintain a relationship with you. We pray your blessing on the the rest of our time here this morning that you would guide and direct our hearts and our our minds to a, a closer relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This, uh, this past summer and fall, I had the opportunity to go through a discipleship study with Pastor Josh. And discipleship is just what we've been talking about. Striving to uh, restore ourselves to that picture of the image in which we were created. And this this is a program that some of you will be going through, I I think, again, pretty shortly. And it's, I think it's going to become a kind of a backbone of what we do here as a church. But it's entitled Gospel DNA. And it's all about gospel change and, and how that can take place. And as I was preparing this, it, 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 it kind of occurred to me, occurred to me that uh, this course is a lot like a tree, okay? At its root is that we all have things about ourselves that we know we need to change to repair our image in the sight of God. They're all things about us that that we know God does not approve of, right? And the trunk, the the main thing that uh, makes that possible 
is the gospel story itself. Uh, the, the creation we, we just talked about in the fall. And then the life and the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus himself. God wants his entire creation to be restored to himself. And then there are these things we're going to be talking about today are the four branches of the tree. These are the four truths about God that we're going to be talking about. And these are, as we go through these, we're going to think they're things that just describe traits or characteristics of God. But they're more than that. They're, they're actually what God is, and that, that should become uh, clearer as we go through. So, Anna, could you put those down? Yeah, four truths. And you also notice there are four burdens that, are, that accompany this. The first one is God is great, so I don't have to be in control. God is glorious, so I don't have to fear others. God is good, so I don't have to look elsewhere. And God is gracious, so I don't have to prove myself. And it became interesting. This, this takes place about halfway through the study. And as we were proceeding beyond that, I found I'd, I'd taken a piece of paper and I'd written those all out and put them in the front of my notebook because I kept referring back to them. I kept needing to, okay, th you know, this is where this fits in. I was telling Josh that. He said, yeah, I've got them, I've got them hung on my wall in my office. I was telling Philip that. He said, yeah, when I took the course, I had them as the, as the screensaver on my computer. That's, that's how important these things are in this study. So the first, the first of the truths, God is good, so I don't have to, or God is great, I'm sorry. God is great, so I don't have to be in control. I think most of us don't have any trouble with the first part of that, right? We can acknowledge that God is good, that God is great. But that second part, the control part, I have a little trouble with that. I'm just, I'm just saying. But back to the greatness. We, we, we sing about, in a lot of our songs, how great God is and the fact that he is great. But what does that really mean? And I don't know when it started, but we are a culture that has to uh, rate things, identify things, categorize things. And we've got this term now that, that pervades our culture, the greatest of all time, the GOAT, right? I was teaching school in Onekama this week, and there's a little fifth grade kid about this big, had a shirt. He was the greatest of all time. You know, and the thing is, if, you, if we break down those categories enough and, and details, we're all the greatest of all time at something, right? You know, I can just about guarantee you I'm the greatest pastor in Manistee County this morning who was born in Tangier, Indiana. And if not, I'm a close second, right? We are, we are, and, and these, these, these people who are the greatest of all time right now, that's true until the next one comes along. You know, it, it, it particularly pervades uh, sports. They'll, you know, who's the greatest quarterback of all time, the, the, the greatest running back of all time, greatest receiver, whatever, greatest coach. You know, and that's all true until the next one comes along. When we say God is great, that's not what we're talking about. He's, he's always been and always will be great. Uh, it's what he is, and he is what it is. He, is. he is greatness personified. You know, the old adage, if you look up great in the dictionary, it should be a picture of God. So how great, how great is our God? We sing that, how great is our God? According to Psalm 145, David writes that his greatness is unfathom, unfathomable, immeasurable. 
And for me, when I really want to think about God's greatness, there are ten words. At the very, very beginning of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let that sink in. God created the heavens and the earth. Essentially, we're saying from nothing, the universe. From nothing. The, the space wasn't even, you know, how do you wrap your head around that? From nothing came the universe. And beyond that, for me, if when he created the things, he had to create the atom. Right? This minuscule thing that we have spent trillions and trillions of dollars trying to understand, trying to split, trying to harness its energy. He created that with the sound of, with the sound of his voice. God has never changed. The atom has never changed. We're the ones who have changed. So, given that perception of, of God's greatness... And the fact that he has set that universe in place and then created the energy to keep it in, to keep it in existence, to keep it in motion. Now, where does that come from? It just, it blows me away. So what makes me think I have control over anything? And given the, the ability he has to control it, why would I want to? Why would I want to think I can control anything? There was a story that, that, an experience that came to my mind as I was thinking about this. When I was in elementary school, on our playground, we had a merry-go-round, right? But it wasn't one of these you see on modern-day playgrounds. It wasn't the thing that's this tall and, you know, you, you fall down onto and ride. I don't know how big it was. But for a seven-year-old kid, it could have been 40 feet tall. But there was this great big, great big, you know, a post that went up through the center of it. And on top of it was this hubcap-looking thing that pivoted all directions, back and forth, you know, round and round. And everything was supported off that. So not only would the thing go around, but it would go back and forth every which direction and go in ellipses and that sort of thing. And, you know, you go out there for recess, and you wanted to get there first so you could, you know, get on a seat. And then the other kids had to push it to get it going, and they would try to hop on. And I was, uh, I, I used to have to wear husky clothes. If, if you're old enough to remember that, there was a certain grade of clothes called husky, and that was me. And it was hard for me to push that thing and get it going, and then... Managed to waller myself up onto the seat, you know. So I figured out if I got there first and got on the seat, I didn't have to do anything. I could let the other kids make it go, you know. That's kind of the way that it is with God. Sometimes we just need to let him take control. Get out of the way and let him do his thing. So truth number one, God is great. I don't have to be in control. The second truth, again, the same thing. This is not something that describes God. This is something that tells what God is. Okay? God is glorious. So I don't have to fear men. Two things we've got to kind of unwrap here. What does it mean to be glorious? Glorious. And what is fear of man? The way Bible, the way glory is, is spoken about in the Bible, it's something that is very weighty, very heavy, majestic, uh, breathtaking, surreal maybe, unforgettable. A once-in-a-lifetime experience, a once-in-a-lifetime thing. If you remember back in the book of Exodus when God is kind of recruiting Moses 
to, uh, to his job, Moses wanted to see God's glory. So the way God dealt with this, he, he tucked Moses back in the rock, right? Shielded him. And he offered him this, this very brief, this shrouded view of his glory because he knew that Moses not, would not be able to understand or uh, be able to, uh, to, to survive seeing God's actual glory. It's, it's that, that stupendous. So that gives us a picture of what glory is. And, of course, glorious is the, the state of, of, of carrying glory. And I, I understand there are, we talk about fear of man. There are situations and places where we should fear other people, right? If we put ourselves in dangerous situations. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this craving we have for other people's approval or the fear of their rejection or disapproval. Now, fear of, fear of man, this, again, this craving we have for their approval and the fear of their disapproval leads to a whole variety of, of problems in our lives. It results in, or can lead into uh, giving into, fe into peer pressure. It causes us to overcommit to things because we're afraid of saying no. It will cause us to embellish stories about ourselves or our experiences so that people will think more highly of us. It can result in jealousy, anger, depression, anxiety, isolation, judging ourselves against others, and ultimately, excuse me, fear of witnessing about Jesus. No wonder Dr. Phil's a billionaire, right? So what's our, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what has been our culture's answer to this, these, this list of problems? We need to boost your self-esteem, right? We need to build you up so that you have all the things you think you deserve. Okay, who's, who's our model for how we are to behave, who we're supposed to be? Jesus, right? When you think of high self-esteem, do you think of Jesus? He was the king who came to be a servant. We talk about Jesus' humiliation, and we tend to think of that happening at the cross, right? Jesus' humiliation began in the manger in Bethlehem when he came to be a lowly person instead of the king that he should have been. The, the Bible doesn't have a great uh, view of high self-esteem. So in, instead of fearing man and worrying about what the neighbor thinks about what I drive or what someone thinks about the, the way I chose to raise my kids or handle my finances or where I worship, what should I be doing? Instead of fearing man, I should be fearing God. and concerning myself with how he regards all those things that we talked about. In spite of what our culture tells us as far as our, our self-esteem, we need a bigger view of God and a smaller one of ourselves. So fear of God involves showing him the respect, the worship, the trust, and the submission that are his due. And one of the really good analogies that they used in that, in that uh, gospel DNA study was a garden hose. And they likened worship to a garden hose. You turn a garden hose on, water's flowing out, right? Our worship is the same way. Wherever we point our garden hose, 
is like wherever we're pointing our work. We can, we're worshiping something all the time, just by our very nature. We may not be consciously doing it, but our life is showing what we worship, what we treasure. Wherever we point that hose is, is the thing that we are, are worshiping. And that hose needs to be pointed toward God all the time. That's where our worship needs to be. So by God's grace, we have the ability to see the glory of God every day as, as New Testament believers. We see it in the life and the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, which is in itself is like, just like we described, something glorious, something weighty. It's a, it's a heavy, big subject, right? Jesus' life and death and burial and resurrection. It's surreal. It's, it's, it's something we can't imagine. It's unforgettable. And it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. So, given what we just talked about, if I have the opportunity to seek someone's approval and acceptance, who should it be? Should it be the neighbor who's commenting about how high my grass is? Or should it be the one who gave his life on the cross so that my, I might have a relationship with my creator? See, God is glorious, so I don't have to fear men. Truth number three, God is good, so I don't have to look elsewhere. God created mankind with needs. Physical, emotional, spiritual. And he did this for a reason. He included them in our makeup to promote a relationship of dependency on him. And there are countless stories in the Bible. We're just going to look at two of them. We think about when, when the nation of Israel fled Egypt. It was a spur of the moment thing, you know. We're going to eat. You eat. You eat the dinner with your sandals on, your staff in your hand, your robe ready to go, the unleavened bread, and we're going to go. Two million people fleeing into the desert. No food truck along with them. No. Flocks and, and herds to take with them, just, just God's people. For 40, for 40 years, God sustained them in the wilderness through his generosity and his love with the, with the manna that he, that he provided. Later in the New Testament, when, when Jesus was, when his teaching was drawing these huge crowds that traveled along with him, There came a time when it was time to, to, to rest, and there was these 20,000 people there. And you know the story. And the disciples said, how, what, how are we going to feed these? We need to send these people away so they can find something to eat. Jesus met the need. He took a, he took a boy's lunch, five loaves and two fish broke it and blessed it and passed it out and fed everyone. And here's what's interesting, he, including the boy. He took the boy's lunch, took everything the boy had. He didn't have to take any of it, but he took, took the boy's lunch to, to teach us a lesson that, hey, if you're going to follow me, it takes everything. But at the end, he fed the boy as well. There's always a process to this that God always follows. First, he creates the need. Think about that. He creates a need in us to bring us to him. Then he supplies the need, but not before we've acknowledged it. I, I lead a, a small group here with four pretty smart guys. Ben, can I use your name? Okay, 
Ben says I can use his name, so I can. A couple weeks ago, we were talking about wants and needs, and you know, they're discussing it around the table. And kind of at the end, Ben says, "You know, I'm paraphrasing. I'm paraphrasing here because I was kind of in awe when he was speaking, but." He said, you know, I treat my needs as, as blessings for the exact same reason we've just said here. He said, my needs drive me back to God repeatedly. He said, so I, I consider all my needs a blessing. I thought, wow, what a, what a profound thing that was. And he doesn't stop with our physical needs. He's there to meet our spiritual needs also. In John's gospel, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever will come to me will never go hungry. And before that, he had said, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. See, God wants to... God wants to provide our needs. He wants us to count on him to have them satisfied. And another, another place where, where Jesus drove this home was in the seventh chapter of Matthew. He's, he, he's speaking to people and he says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, who are evil, all of us, know how to give good food to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you, give good gifts to those who ask him? We, we think we're generous. We think we, think we, we take care of our children, right? We fall short compared to what God wants to do for us. He wants to provide all our needs. He doesn't want us to be going out on our own to try to, try to fulfill them or supply them. God is good. I don't have to look elsewhere. Truth number Number four, God is gracious, so I don't have to prove myself. <laughs> it's like in Agata de Vida, you know, big drum solo right in the center. God is gracious, so I don't have to prove myself. Grace, we had a little, little defining to do here, a little definition. Kind of the universal des description of grace is unmerited or undeserved favor from God. And again, this is not a trait, not a description. This is who God is, okay? God, by his very nature exemplifies grace. Now, if you remember back about two months ago, I was up here, and we talked about the parable, or we, yeah, we studied the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And just to kind of recap that story, two men went up to the temple in Jerusalem to pray, one a Pharisee and one a tax collector. And as the Pharisee was going into the temple to pray, he stopped and just quietly spoke to God. He said, God, thank you. I'm not like all these extortioners and lawbreakers and sinners, and especially not like that tax collector I saw outside. I'm thankful I'm so much better than that. Lord, I, I fast twice a week. And I tithe on everything I receive. So he was feeling pretty good about himself, right? 
In the meantime, the tax collector was not even allowed into the temple. He was out outside. And the parable tells us that while the, while the Pharisee was uplifting himself, you know, putting himself in what he thought was good light with God, the tax collector was beating his chest, had his head hung down, couldn't even stand to look up. And his prayer was, God, forgive me, a sinner. Now, Jesus was telling this parable to church leaders who thought they were they thought they were establishing a relationship with God because of their, <clears throat> their good acts and the way they were behaving. And as Jesus was wrapping up the parable, he says, let me tell you, that man, the one who was beating his chest, crying out to God for mercy, he was the one who was justified. He was the one who was establishing a right relationship with God. In the same way we just talked about God supplying his children's needs, he also wants to have <clears throat> an intimate and personal relationship with his children, with us. The wonder is that by his grace and by, again, the life, the death, the burial and resurrection of Jesus, he has paved the way for us who deserve nothing. We deserve, based on our nature, based on his nature, we deserve death. No argument, no negotiation about it. That's what we deserve. And that should be our lot. But God wants different. He wants a relationship with us, and he's provided the way to wash out that stain of sin that we all carry. And he says, come, come to me. Because there's nothing I need to do, nothing I can do to secure that, to secure that relationship. And any efforts I make to prove myself would not make me right with God. Because that would give me a reason to be proud of something that I have no business being proud of. I have nothing to do with it. And even if I do try to prove myself and come up short, I'm forgiven. So I bear no guilt. So I bear no pride. I bear no guilt when it comes to standing before God. Instead, because of the work of Jesus on the cross, I can be confident in my relationship with God confident in the fact that he has provided the way for me to have that relationship and he's made sure that it happens and secondly I can be humble because I know it always has it still does and always will require his grace there's four truths about God as we close things up here we, we came this morning four truths right four truths about God and four four burdens that that we all all bear in trying to do these things on our own and not allowing God just to take take control Yield to his glory, accept his goodness, and accept his grace. And that's my challenge to all of us as we move forward. You should have a copy of these things in your hand, in, your, in the bulletin this morning. And, you know, as I alluded to earlier, there's something I have found myself just falling back on time after time since we started learning about them. Because I need that reminder every day. God is great. I don't have to be in control. 
God is glorious. I don't have to fear men. God is good. I don't need to look elsewhere. And God is gracious. I don't need to prove myself. And like I said, I, my, my challenge is that we take those home, put them someplace where you can uh, keep an eye on them and refer back to them every day. So as we enter this time of communion, one of the big messages today was that God wants a relationship with us, his children. And he has gone to the lengths to make sure that happens. The main feature of that work was Christ's death on the cross. That's what really opened the door for us to be able to come to him and we get the privilege every week here to remember and to celebrate that time in history where we we take these few minutes here take the cup take the bread and inject them apply them into our lives come and be 